Hi everybody, this is Matthew Miller. I am the Fedora project leader and this is a Fedora Council video call. Meetings are terrible, so we try not to do them, except it turns out we also don't get any work done if we don't meet regularly. So we do IRC meetings, um, matrix chat meetings um, several times a month. And once a month about, we do a video call where we usually focus on some part of the project where something interesting is happening or something um, that maybe needs help or something we want to um, highlight. Uh, today we actually have something a little bit different. We have our proposal to um, I guess make Fedora officially a digital public good. And so we have some folks from that project to talk with us about it. And um, I guess I'll turn things over to Justin who brought the idea to us and you can introduce your co-conspirators and um, go from there. Uh, and uh, then we'll, have a, we'll talk about it. I see there's slides. Awesome. Yes, I do see your slide. Perfect. Cool. So we can go ahead and get started here. So uh, for context, this first began, like Matthew said, there is currently a ticket in the Fedora Council PAGOR, which I'll drop a link here in the chat. If anyone is curious, we can probably get that in the video description too. But this is extending from that conversation that began in the council ticket. So the ticket is proposed is suggesting or nominating Fedora to apply as a digital public good. Based on the conversations we had with the Fedora Council back in April and May, we decided to do the video chat today as a chance to go deeper on what does this really mean? What are digital public goods? Does Fedora fit into this? And what, what comes next? So we'll do a quick introduction for the folks that are here. Um, a lot of you know me, my name is Justin. I've been a Fedora contributor for six or seven years now. I joined the UNICEF Office of Innovation in June 2020 as their open source technical advisor. There I work with startup companies and UNICEF country offices from around the world on six different continents, building open source projects and communities and following best practices to build a community, which a lot of things I've had the benefit of seeing how it works in Fedora. Uh, and I'll pass over to Victor here for. Hi, everyone. Thank you for welcoming to your community. I must admit I'm not a Fedora user, but I feel very welcome here. I'm an open source um, contributor and project maintainer in other parts of the open source universe. And I work as the engineering and technology lead at the Office of Innovation and the Digital Public Goods Alliance, which we will introduce shortly. So shall I start? Next well, slide, just yeah. over to you. Welcome. Uh, do you want questions throughout or do you want to do the presentation or how do you prefer to do this? It's up to you. I mean, I, I like Probably conversations. &A. So. Yeah, well, I guess if there's questions that come up, it makes sense. We'll definitely have time for Q&A at the end, too. Okay. Yes, I think that the, and the, more, the more questiony part of the presentation is towards the end. I feel the first one is more sharing information and setting up the context. So I think it's less likely to have questions in that part. Okay. Okay, so next slide. I'd like to start with a very brief historic perspective on sort of prior events that led us to where we are today so that we are all on the same page. So very, very briefly, about three years ago, in July 2018, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres convened a high-level panel on digital cooperation to strengthen collaboration in the digital space among governments, private sector, civil society, international organizations, academia, and other relevant stakeholders. The panel was tasked with raising awareness about the transformative impact of digital technologies and looking to ensuring a safe and inclusive digital future for all. Fast forward two years later, June 2020, actually one day from today on June 11th, when UN Secretary General presented a set of recommended actions to help ensure all people are connected, respected, and protected in the digital age. There are a number of recommendations in that um, report of which I'm gonna highlight three. First one being achieving universal connectivity by 2030. Another one is promoting digital public goods, which brings us to the topic of this conversation, and that is embracing the internet's open source and public origins. And another one was ensuring and protecting uh, human rights in the digital era. So 
digital so the 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 the, the report introduces this concept of digital public goods which include open ai models as for artificial intelligence models open source software open data open content and open standards next slide but what really are um, digital public goods so the the report provided this one liner definition of being open source software open data open ai models open standards and open content that adhere to privacy and other applicable laws and best practices do no harm and help attain the sustainable development goals so basically it's like projects in the open that advance um, humanity as as a whole but as good as this definition is as a one-liner it is hard to use it as as a flag as, as, as a reference for deciding whether whether something is or is not a digital public goods next slide so that's why some of us um, about a year ago or more came came up with this notion of the digital public goods standard which again is also an open project um, which you can contribute give your opinions comment see if we are missing something or we're doing something wrong but essentially the the idea behind the standard is operationalize that definition and translate it into a number of indicators and a corresponding set of questions that we can ask of any project and form a, a common opinion on whether that is indeed a digital public good or not so we are looking and i'm looking at the right side of the slide on you know these are these nine indicators of whether the project is relevant to the sustainable development goals whether it uses an approval approved open license there's clear ownership there's platform independence meaning uh, it does not depend on some other proprietary um, elements uh, further down there's good documentation for sure this mechanism for extracting data that is not personal identifiable information, adheres to privacy and applicable laws, and adheres to standards and best practices, and does no harm, which, for example, does no harm, we further um, unpack into protecting underage users, must say moderating harmful content like hate speech, and protecting personal, in, in, personal information of um, of, of the users that participate in, in those projects. So we turned all this into, um, into sort of a questionnaire, a, a submission that we collect information from all these projects and we try to assess fairly and objectively whether a project is a digital public good or not. Next slide. So, um, so this is the work of the Digital Public Goods Alliance, which was a uh, multi-stakeholder initiative, meaning it was it had UNICEF, Government of Norway, Government of Sierra Leone, Indian Think Tank um, as the founding members, but it's open to more uh, to more entities, with the mission of of accelerating the attainment of the Sustainable Development Goals in low and middle income countries by facilitating the discovery. And I'll t t talk about each of those discovery, development, the use of, and investment in digital public goods. Next slide. So, our approach at the Digital Public Goods Alliance, of which UNICEF is part of, is to, f on one side, identify open source solutions that contribute to a, a more equitable world. And we also have these communities of practice, which say are groups of experts that further um, evaluate and support digital public goods in priority areas. Currently, we have communities of practice in early grade reading, financial inclusion, digital health, focusing on vaccine delivery systems, um, very timely, and climate adaptation. And more um, are, will be added over time. Then, we are also in trying to increase access to solutions via the creation and curation of this registry of digital public goods, goods which aims to be sort of a catalog or a one-stop shop for, for finding projects that advance sustainable development goals, whether you are 
a government that wants to implement, you are a member of the community that wants to contribute, or you have some ideas uh, that you want to create and you want to don't want to reinvent the wheel, you can see what's already existing and, and so on. And then we, through the work of UNICEF and the various governments that we work with, um, including our funders like Norway, we engage with Pathfinder countries. We call Pathfinder countries those that sort of lead the way and you know, craft the path um, to share either existing DPGs that uh, already exist in their countries or those who are interested, those countries that are interested in um, implementing their national digital infrastructure using digital public goods instead of relying on proprietary solutions. So, in a way, we're also trying to tackle the procurement processes of those countries which are complex in nature and steward them or shift them towards the adoption of open solutions. Next slide. I'll pass it on to Justin. Thanks. So building on that part of the conversation. So is Fedora Linux fit into this puzzle? How how does how do these two different sides of things connect together? So earlier you probably caught that Victor mentioned the UN Sustainable Development Goals, but I want to go back to those really quick and just also provide some historical context as to what these are and why why this matters in the DPG conversation. So if you're not familiar with what these uh, these sustainable development goals are, they came out of a 2030 agenda for sustainable development. And this was adopted by all the United Nations member states in 2015. It provides a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people on the planet now and into the future. And at its heart are 17 sustainable development goals or the SDGs, which are an urgent call for action by all these countries developed and developing in a global partnership. They recognize that ending poverty and other deprivations, they go hand in hand with strategies to improve health and education, reduce inequality and spur economic growth, all while tackling climate change and working to preserve oceans and forests, um, which might, so just to add some, or, or provide a little more context of how this began, even though this was from a 2015 uh, agenda, these goals have been worked, uh, they're not really new. These actually go back all the way to 1992, where in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, more than 178 countries adopted Agenda 21. And this was a comprehensive plan of action to build a global partnership for sustainable development, to improve human lives and protect the environment. So this is really where these conversations were, were started in the very beginning. Building on that as well, in the year 2000, um, United Nations member states unanimously adopted the Millennium Declaration, and this included eight Millennium Development Goals to reduce extreme poverty by 2015. So, the, the Sustainable Development Goals, these 17 goals that have been identified since 2015 and are targeted for the 2030 Agenda for Global Sustainability, uh, these are all a part of where these come in together. And like I said, all of these have been, these aren't really new ideas or new concepts. These are things that we've been talking about for decades already. However, there's one of these goals today that I really want to hone in on and how it applies to Fedora. So specifically goal nine, industry innovation and infrastructure, which is its one-liner definition is building resilient infrastructure, promoting inclusive and sustainable industrialization and fostering innovation. Okay, so a lot of times when we think of infrastructure, we're usually thinking of roads, bridges, cars, planes, trains, automobiles, all these very physical things. But does infrastructure, is, is infrastructure only physical? In the 21st century, what does digital infrastructure mean in the context of the internet, cell towers and undersea fiber cables across the ocean. Digital infrastructure is this new emerging type of infrastructure for our hyper-connected online world. Digital infrastructure is the backbone of delivering, serving, and sharing content across the web and over borders. 
Yeah, I, I don't think you have to sell me on that. I think Fedora Linux is definitely an infrastructure project. Sure. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So where I'm going with this is looking at where we are now with the DP, the digital public goods work and thinking about what infrastructure means. Our world is more and more interconnected. And now we have this opportunity to really think about what digital infrastructure means. The Ford Foundation released a report a couple of years ago that 2018 that was a groundbreaking report on this of like what is this digital infrastructure and how do we define it and how do we how do we talk about these things so now is this good opportunity to really look back on the last 20 to 40 years of free and open source software thinking about key examples of things that have worked well and things that haven't and finding new ways to empower users or everyday people through technology tying it into fedora there's actually some really key elements of the Fedora community that position Fedora in addition to meeting the digital public good standards that actually put Fedora in a really op great, op great position to be able to be involved with this global network. So I, I always like to go to the four foundations. Since I know there's folks who might not be familiar with that on the call, the four foundations are these very structural value-based definitions of, of the Fedora community, right? Oh, um, why we do what we do. So how does this tie into the digital public goods standard and, and digital infrastructure? So I think each, each foundation speaks for itself. With the Freedom Foundation, Fedora was built as free and open source software from the beginning. Fedora only ships and distributes free software from the default repositories. We're notorious in the Linux world for not bundling or providing proprietary software by default. And Fedora already uses widely accepted open source licenses and has even contributed to the definition of some of these licenses in the, over, the, over the decades. And then Friends, the Friends Foundation. Fedora has an international community of hundreds of folks spread across six continents. The Fedora community is strong and well positioned to scale as the upstream distribution for arguably one of the world's most widely used enterprise flavors of Linux. That's so much of our digital infrastructure. It's not an argument, on... yes. <laughs> yes, yeah. And then features, uh, again, Fedora consistently delivering on innovation and features and open source. Fedora 34 was a record breaking release with 63 new approved changes just in that last release, 18-year uh, record for us. And finally, first, Fedora leverages its unique position and resources in the free software world to deliver on innovation. New ideas and features are trialed out in the Fedora community to discover what works and what doesn't. We have many stories of both. So looking at this context of how the Fedora community has built has been built and operated over the last 18 years and looking at these these emerging conversations about digital public goods and digital infrastructure and what this means this puts fedora in a really good great position to help broaden the definition of what digital infrastructure means so often when we look at or at least in, this is in my own personal experience but you'll see a lot of humanitarian driven projects that have a very specific use case or or goal, but I think sometimes we miss or, or we, we don't always understand the complexity of all these dependencies and how the internet works from the very lowest level things of you know cabling and infrastructure to DNS and building up on that in the in the stack. Fedora is in a really great position to use its community, well, not use its community, but work with its community to advocate for these things that we've already been doing pretty well. For, our, for almost two decades, maybe more if you want to count Red Hat Linux in there. But um, this, this, or all these, th these contexts to me are what make Fedora stand out as a, as a prime example of a Linux distribution being represented as a digital public good in both ways that other Linux distributions that um, ship or provide proprietary software are unable to do. And, um, uh, and also around the licensing piece. So here I'll go ahead Justin, and pass it. Yeah. Do you have Do you have our uh, vision statement on the next slide here? Uh, I don't know. I should. Let, I should have it let on me, here. Let me read it here because I think this is very very well aligned. This is the vision statement that we uh, adapted just recently. 
The Fedora project envisions a world where everyone benefits free and open source software built by inclusive, welcoming, and open-minded communities. And I think that's very well aligned with the um, initial statement that the digital public goods thing came out of as well. It's kind of a, a there's, there's obviously a shared goal. Absolutely. So for here, I'll go ahead and pass over to Victor just to walk through some of the actual very practical steps of, okay, how do you actually go through this? How do you nominate to become a digital public good? Uh, so I'll pass back over to you, Victor. Okay, thanks, Justin. Okay, so if you have been mildly convinced by Justin's arguments, you might be wondering, okay, what do we do now or how do we take this up? Next slide. So, um, very quickly, the benefits of, first I want to go over the sort of the benefits of, of becoming a digital public good, as you may say, well, yeah, that's great, but you know, why? Um, I mean, I think that the most important one is the alignment in vision that Matthew was referring to. Now, if we say take it one level down, um, we want to highlight this three, which is participating in a global network of projects and communities and of and people building free and open source software, of which Fedora already has a, a strong and, and, and big community. So you might say, well, we already have that there. Um, number two is, I mean, it's true, increased visibility of open source projects in, in the registry, um, both allowing more users and potential contributors to, to, to discover it for the, the first time. Again, visibility might not be the selling point for Fedora, but it's, I think that there's, there's this, um, I, I see a growing generational trend of people wanting to contribute to projects that that do good, that, in, that leave a mark in the world. And being able to classify Fedora as a digital public good, I think speaks to this growing audience of um, young contributors that want to put their skills to good use. And then last but not least, there's wider reach of uh, global communities through the engagement with Pathfinder countries where, you know, when we when we get, re we as the different entities that form this alliance get requests from national and regional governments on um, modernizing their infrastructure, we can say, well, you know, um, consider um, Fedora as, 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 as running the, the backbone of, 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 of your systems or, or, or things to that end. And, and building um, local communities in many of those countries that can take it up and support it moving forward and, and so on. Next slide, next one, like, next slide and last one is the actual um, submission process is by, um, well, we need a or uh, some representatives of the project that can speak on behalf of the project and can make assertions on behalf of the project where we will ask to compile um, answers to the series of questions that cover the, the indicators that I uh, presented earlier in this call. And the complete set of questions is available online, of course, prior to submitting the form so that there can be further discussion on whether um, you, know, you feel that you have the right answers to those questions or not. Or, and, and in most cases, this is also a conversation where we ask, say, for a first submission, and then we'll go back and say, well, can you clarify this, or can you provide more evidence on that, and so on. But essentially, we will receive the, the submission that you provided to us. There's a first stage where we nominate a process where we, say, set the threshold fairly low, where we are only looking at open source, um, the open source requirements and the alignment to the sustainable development goals, and we then you become one of those 500 or 600 projects that are being nominated to become a digital public good. And then we conduct a more the, the technical review, more extensive review. And then if everything checks, then we, uh, we come to the resolution that this is indeed a digital public good and <clears throat> we, we catalog it as, as such. Justin, last slide. And that's all that we had prepared for, for the presentation today. So 
thanks for your your audience. And if there's any questions or um, anything you'd like to ask, you can either put it into the chat or come on audio video. Thanks. I definitely. I definitely have some questions. First of all, thank you for presenting this and sharing this. I think it's very interesting. And like I said, I think the concepts are well aligned. Um, I have uh, some concerns about the obligations we would take up as this. Um, first of all, uh, do we obligate ourselves legally to meet certain standards? Are we agree are we agreeing to something? Is there or is it just a um, you are agreeing that we meet these standards. I would not, I mean, that's a good question. Um, I would not frame it a, as a legal obligation. And I'm going to say this by bidirectionally, in that neither you are obligated legally to comply with that, nor we are legally bound to the truthness, truthfulness of your answers, meaning all the answers that are provided and that allow us to, this, to, to screen you against a digital public good standard are self-reported. And we rely on your word, on the truthfulness and accuracy of those answers. So, I'm going to attack it. I'm going to tackle this from both sides. If someone comes to us and says, "Hey, you said that this is a digital public good, and these guys and this project um, said that they comply with these standards, but we actually re um, discovered that that's not true," then, well, we are open to reviewing any submission anytime. But then we'll say, "Well, this is information that was reported to us." and we took their word for it. On the other hand, um, if anything changes and say project A um, is open source, but one day they decide to go closed source, boo, then well, we, we review it and then we remove it from the catalog or from the registry and it is no longer a digital public good. Now, if we ask you whether you comply with the standards and you tell us that you comply with this set of standards, we expect that information to be truthful. So, one of the standards I think uh, I have a little bit of a hard time with, ironically, maybe, is the do no harm one, um, mm -hmm. because it, it's such a, like, I, I, I yes. get the, the idea, we, but it's such a broad to... thing. And people's idea of what harm is is, um, you know, varies from person to person in pretty fundamental ways sometimes. Uh, and our answer in general has been, you know, to not restrict fields of, of use for for Linux. And, and um, we have the hope that although we know that that probably does allow for some harm to happen, um, that the greater the the overall impact of of not having those restrictions. Um, is beneficial to everybody, um, mm -hmm. but I, I, you know, I can't necessarily say that that's a do no harm stance. Um, I know, you know, people are probably using Fedora platforms for Bitcoin mining and blowing up the environment with greenhouse gases with that. I know yes. Fedora is used in high frequency trading, which people think, you know, is um, part of the gigantic problem with you know rent taking in the stock market right like th those things and, and fedora is used as as part of that right um there are plenty of other examples um you could come up with uh and i i don't know i don't know how to answer that in a way that feels satisfying um i, I other than saying you know we mean well i, I, I hear your concern oh no go ahead yeah, just just some context, I think coming back to the DPG standard and looking at that clear ownership piece in the context of a project like Fedora that's already well established and is, has a pretty large international reach in terms of users and what people might do, choose to do on their own. I think that that clear ownership part of the standard and specifically Fedora's, um, I think, excellent document, public documentation about the trademark and guidelines around using that trademark 
would really be helpful here. Because while I don't say imagine the Fedora project going to deploy Fedora Linux to do Bitcoin mining for the Fedora project, if someone else is willing to do that and wants to make a big commotion or big scene about it and raise questions of the ethic the ethics of is this doing harm or is it not, I think there's a there's a degree here that this has not been explored. So part of this, I think, well, maybe Victor has other thoughts there, but I think there's part here that through Fedora's management of trademark, a lot of those risks about what does harm mean and who gets to decide what is Fedora Linux or not is mitigated through Fedora's trademark policy. Yes, and I, I hear you um, clearly on the concerns that you have, and I will admit that we struggle to some extent with it too. And here is one place where I would welcome any input that any members of your community have in regards to bringing more clarity on how the do no harm applies to infrastructure projects like Fedora. We, I'm going to give an example from another field because, and also bear in mind that this standard covers software content data, to, you know, to name three very different. And, you know, looking at content, for example, we did some work in, at the beginning with early grade reading, aka children's books. So we looked at platforms that provided um, children's books in, in many languages. And you can, and so we were looking at things for like, well, are these children's books um, promoting, you know, ideals of, of, pay, of peace and, and human dignity and respect and all that, or are they advancing hateful, hateful speech? And, and, if, and do they have mechanisms, say, for reporting that they, they, someone is trying to publish a racist book? or a discriminatory book. You, know, you cannot, well, in, in that case, we were looking again for mechanisms that would be able to report, flag, and remove that type of content without, without you know, having absolute control of what anyone or everyone publishes on those platforms or whether the intent was good, but then someone turned it around and, okay, they, they cloned the project and they use it for all this, you know, to publish all these creepy books. There's that much that, that, that we can go, but at least we want to capture sort of the intent and the inclusion of mechanisms, practices to curve bad behavior where it exists. Now, we have also been um, looking at this issue with infrastructure projects like digital IDs and say, and, and the developers tell us, yes, we developed this project for good and we expect governments to use it for good, but what if then a, um, either a bad actor on the government or an authoritarian government uses these digital identities to discriminate against certain part of the population? I mean, at some point we set sort of a boundary between the the ones who develop the project and develop it with good intentions and a good sort of um, frame of framework and allowed for controls and checks and policies to keep it within that framework and the responsibility of the implementers or the end users who can turn around that project and use it for whatever they want. You know, you as a project maintainer are not bound or um, responsible for all the potential uses downstream that anyone can make of your project. It's, it's a very, it's a, it's a difficult terrain, but still we want to try to carve out a space where we identify projects that are really it are meant for doing good things, and when implemented right, they are uh, advancing humanity forward. So I have some questions um, as far as the process for nomination and all of that. From the start of the nomination to 
know, approving or, you know, denying the digital public goods deal of approval. How long does that process usually take? And, uh, you know, how involved is, is the nomination process? Is it, basically I'm trying to understand how much work it will take. And then I guess a follow-up would be, is there, like, do you resurvey or have a conversation with us? At any point, can we expect to, you know, have some more uh, to do uh, to keep it up and running, et cetera? Yes, very good question. Um, based, I'm going to give numbers based on what we have observed other projects to 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 take and and us with them. So I say that projects take between one or two weeks to collect the information required to fill in the form that varies greatly of on the the, the size of the project and how many people each uh, the project involves to compile that information and say reach an agreement on the answers but so that's a process that would be entirely in your hands and you can get a sense you can get a sense both for the complexity of the information that we are asking, both in the set of questions that we are asking of, and you can review the submissions of the 20 plus projects that we have reviewed already, where we publish their answers publicly online. So you have sort of a template or sort of guidance in framing those, those answers. Um, then once you submit that, question, all that information is captured publicly in open um, pull requests to our repositories, so everything is transparent, um, except some contact information that we require to be able to reach out to you that we keep private. Um, and then it takes about, say, one or two weeks, say, one week or two or three days for the nomination, which is sort of the low threshold um, review, and then between one or two weeks for the more extensive review, which might include back and forth um, emails or comments on the pull request seeking clarification on the, the answers that you have provided. Okay, that does give me a good idea. Um, another question I have is, I see that you have had 585 nominees and 33 approved, oops, sorry, <laughs> uh, 33 approved as digital public good. So that just, it's a, it's a low um, ratio yes. there. So I do, I know, and I see that the, um, the standards are stringent as they should be. Um, but I'm curious, like, is there a, is, can you point to some reason why so little of them are actually approved? Yes, because this we started this we started the the registry or the infrastructure that is this that's behind on the page that you are seeing prior to establishing the standard. And initially, our goal was a landscaping effort of surveying what projects exist in this space of potentially what can be called digital public goods without going too deep in each of those projects. So initially we did a very shallow but broad pass at what's out there, which yielded about 400, 500 of those mm, projects. And we also cross-checked or we partnered with similar entities to ours that were building similar lists. And we compiled, again, a lot of information, but very shallow on many projects. And they were not those partnering organizations that we work with. They were not collecting all that information. So it's been only, say, in the past six or eight months that we have really been digging into the standard. and prioritizing areas. So prior, before I talked about these communities of practice in health, early grade reading, financial inclusion, where in each community of practice we are looking 
at 10 or 12 projects and we have a very close relationship with each of them and we work with them to do full submissions, review the standard, work with them to how they can um, or don't overlook certain aspects of their project so that they are compliant and so on. And that's how we get that number to 33 or so. So now we have um, say, and this is also public on our repo, we have priority areas where we have groups of say eight or 10 projects that we are trying to screen through, uh, through, the, digital, through the standard. So, and it's in, in that small group of 10 or 20 that I would put your submission uh, when, if when we receive it, and these are the ones that we can um, uh, review in this one to two week time frame. We have this backlog of 400 projects of which we have not received a full submission and we do not have the information at hand to screen them properly. And we are, we are open in acknowledging that it's currently a low priority in reaching out to them until we clear the backlog of the ones that we do have all that information. So that's the explanation for the discrepancy between those numbers. That makes complete sense. Um, I wouldn't have known that from the web page. I don't know if you want to like maybe add a note in there. Would be, it, yes, yes. Uh, it would help out to understand the context of that number. Um, another question. Um, gosh. I've got one while you're, oh, while you're remembering Oh, yours. I have okay. it. I was going to ask if there are any other Linux-based operating systems that have been given the Digital Public Good certification. No, not yet. So we would be first in that. And in that. do you feel, <laughs> and, and I mean, Justin is saying this is, does seem like part of the scope. Do you feel as someone who's been working with this organization for a long while now that, that Fedora is a good fit for this? Um, yes, otherwise I wouldn't be presenting here. Um, but <laughs> Fair enough. I, but I, I don't, but I, I'll be honest and I don't think this is necessarily a straight shot and I expect some skepticism or some questions for you or some pushback and say, well, how about this or how about that, which I, and I, and I come here sort of very open and hoping that through some of those conversations, the standard will evolve and we will get a better sense of, you know, what's in and, and what's out. So again, I expect some pushback or some changes to the standard or the process as a result of considering Fedora because it is really, it is very different from any and all other projects that have, of all those 33 that have been screened so far. So my my other question is also kind of about our obligations, and this one is different from the like the agreement obligations, but um, perception of um, our um, ability to support people who are coming to this and say, ah, this is an approved digital public good. Um, let's say you know a some nation decides to standardize on Fedora Linux as their national, you know, operating system. And then they come to us and say, uh, you made this thing, um, make sure it works. We have this problem, fix this. This is not working very well. Um, this is broken. You know, our entire economy collapsed because of you. Um, <laughs> like what, um, how do we keep that from happening? Um, I, I, maybe that's a um, too much victim of our success thing. We're not even worried about at this level, but I think it kind of is. It, you know, even this happens on you know, like people who make an open source library that becomes popular, and then people start demanding their you know their time, and you know, the GitHub becomes their you know trying to ant triage requests becomes a full time job. Um, if we're promoting this at this kind of approved, you know, v very high you know, world standard kind of level, how do we live up to that? Well, I do not have the definitive answer to that question, but I guess I'll share with you 
some additional work that we are doing, I guess, to mitigate that concern. And that is that, well, few things have to happen to reach that stage. The first one is that governments embrace open source and they equate it fully to, to, to commercially available solution. We are working with governments first to educate the pros and cons of open source, the advantages and disadvantages. And one big aspect of that education is telling them that you have to invest in the community, you have to invest in the capacity building, and that you, well, depending on how you implement it or, or what vendor do you find for for this software, um, you would get one level of support or another. Um, the other one is that we, again, not only we are educating or and I don't want to sound paternalistic. Not only we are working with governments to 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 help them better understand what the open source ecosystem looks like, but we are also working with some of them to build the local ecosystem of, um, say, communities, companies, whatever, uh, that can provide that level of support locally. Because, say, you pick country X in region Y of the world, and I don't think it's sustainable to expect that if they implement national air infrastructure at the national level, they'll have to rely from um, technical support coming from Europe, Japan, or, or, or the US. They would want a strong and very capable local community in that country to provide the not only the support but also the development adaptation of that software to their needs so we are working with them and developing resources so that they can take that or they can preemptively um, develop that that level of local capacity so that they can rely on that community instead of coming back to you and blaming you for something that you might not be able to deliver or that you are not expected to deliver. All right. I, I, th I think that's a, that's a pretty good answer. I, I appreciate that. Um, I guess my other my question now is for other people in the Fedora Council here. What are, what are you thinking about this? Do you have... Um, P positive thoughts. I mean, my, I'll, I'll be, I'll go first. Um, I, I'm willing to go ahead, even though I've got some reservations, um, and 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 see see where this we're exploring it leads us. Um, but I'd like to hear what other people are thinking as well. I think it's also something I'm feeling positive about. I'm curious um, if. Uh, if there's any, like, you mentioned the legal thing, said it wasn't a legal obligation, but pardon me, so says, like, to probably check in with Red Hat on, on the digital public good aspect. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I know we have other Red Hatters on the call and ex-Red Hatters. So I'm curious, like, is this something that we need to kind of involve our parent corporation in? I, it, it probably is, and I, I can take care of that aspect of it. Um, okay. So I just would would be curious, I guess, also to hear Red Hat's input on it um, before we get our hearts set on it. Though it does seem like it's something that would align with Red Hat's vision for Fedora, I think. Um, one thing that I'm curious about is uh, how, you know, having us on that specific list helps us become an enabler of sorts to you know, build certain kind of digital public goods from Fedora itself. So we are not just one of those goods, but we also help to develop those kinds of goods in future. So uh, I'd be really curious if that seems to happen down the line. But uh, yeah, that is something I'm uh, excited about. Uh, 
Um, again, I very good question and challenging. That's the type of questions that I'm expecting from this crowd. I do not have an answer. Um, but I'm also expecting um, sort of digital public goods to build on one another. Or, and again, Fedora, I think it, it's it's a different it's different than the ones we had. Um, maybe we would have we would need to bring others to help us figure out how developing that ecosystem unfolds. Um, I guess I'm trying to make an analogy, say, for example, with we have a, a community of practice around financial inclusion and we have um, various projects around, say, the financial stack, if, if you will, of identity, payments, um, uh, interface with banking system and whatnot, that each of them are a digital public good in itself, but we're also looking at how they interoperate or how others can build on the systems that they provide. I say it's an ongoing conversation. We don't have, you know, a set of guidelines or anything that we have concluded, but um, that is something that other people are wondering as well in terms of how how how, how this bigger com broader community or meta community um, comes about and and enables something greater than each of the individual projects. So we're coming up to our hour here. Um, what are our next steps, practically speaking? Yes, so practically speaking, you would essentially submit, make a submission, fill, it, fill out a form and submit. What that means is answering, um, I mean, there are nine indicators. Some of those indicators are broken into a number of questions and there's some logic on whether this applies to you or not. But let's say there are 30 to 40 questions that you would, that you would need to answer. And again, we can provide all the questions in advance and you would look into the information that you need to collect in order to uh, make that submission. Thank you, Lucy, for providing that link in the chat here. Um, so this is a, a web-based form. Um, yes. Can you start this process and then come back to it, or is it a? Um, for, if for the person that starts it, yes, you cannot have multiple contributors to the same submission. And okay. I'm saying this: we we used to rely on um, commercially available forms that didn't work for us, so we developed this in-house from scratch. It works for us, but the functionality is limited. Um, of course, if anyone wants to improve the form, the code is open source and we would welcome that. But right now, just so that you know, um, you open a session in that form, we plant a cookie that remembers who you are on using that form, and in the next 30 days, it remembers that you started filling in some answers and will pre-populate if, if you lose it and come back. Um, I recommend um, filling it in one go, though. Okay. So uh, take, taking um, a copy of, of the of, of questions offline, then filling them, and then filling the form. That's what I meant. Okay. And I'm actually looking here. It looks actually pretty. It, it is not a long form, really. It's just a basic questions about each each thing. Yes, but be be mindful that some questions unfold. Yes, I see here. Um, okay, um, Justin, um, do you want to continue to take lead on this? Uh, do you, maybe, maybe I, I, I want to talk to some people at Red Hat about um, how Red Hat feels about this, but maybe sometime in the next couple of weeks we could do a working session and go through the form and see what happens. Um, I think... Happy to keep up in the council ticket, whatever's, yeah. whatever's easy. Um, and I think that we can actually like go through some of this process and start working on it because I don't hear any loud objections. Um, and if um, at some point you know uh, the council is feeling uneasy, we can 
we can um, adjust or, or stop what we're doing um, and maybe make a further official decision once we're kind of further along in the exploration. I think that makes most sense to me. In line with the uh, Fedora Council principle of do things rather than wait, wait for approval and hey, when when there's when there's not negative consequences uh, let's just let's just um, see what we can do and Matthew for your information as a disclosure um, Lucy and I from the Digital Public Goods Alliance we have been talking to some people at Red Hat mostly on their corporate responsibility arm a, around possible collaborations and possible support from Red Hat to digital public goods at large. Um, so I say that, I, I'm just saying this so that yeah. you know that they have some awareness, can, but. Um, can you tell me who you've problem. been talking to, either here or send me email? Deborah yes, Brandt, I can. I think. I can. Oh. Uh, I'm right. not sure if that was the right. Deborah. You say Deb Bryant? Yes, yes. Yeah. That's one um, of them. I don't Alex, know if that's it. Please think. Okay, um, that that's awesome because Deb was one of the first people I was planning to talk to about this, anyways. So uh. she's she's aware, or like she's aware of of the of our work, and you should have an easy, or you, you yeah, she should have some context for this conversation. All right, that sounds good. Cool. Um, and I think we're actually over the hour here. This was a good conversation. Um, ben, do we have something scheduled for our next month? You're muted, or no audio. Uh, uh, oh, well, uh, maybe maybe next month our session will be about Pipewire and how great it is at audio writing. Uh, thank you, everybody. I'll uh, see you around, and we'll do the skin video next month. Bye. Thanks, Justin and Victor. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.